I want to welcome you to Back to the Bible Canada, and it's Easter Sunday, and so I just want to say Happy Easter. I know that most of us are not meeting in our local churches, and we're at home, and maybe the family is gathered, or however, you're, maybe you're all alone, and you're wondering, how do you celebrate Easter? How are you glad for the resurrection of Jesus when, you know, there's no one to be glad with, and you wish you were with a much greater group of people, and, and I understand. However, the good news of Easter is still as good as it can possibly be. And uh, I trust the time that we spend together that uh, you're in fact going to rejoice uh, at this time of the year. What I've decided to do today is to take the four Gospels, that is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those four books in the Bible, tell the story of Jesus. And I want to look specifically at the Easter account, and I want to do a harmony Uh, combining the four accounts together to retell the Easter story from all four accounts put together. Now, you probably know, and if you don't know, let me say it now, that there are marked differences between the four accounts of Jesus. And that doesn't mean there's a contradiction. It does mean there are differences. I want to give you an example. Let's say, for instance, that you're interviewing and investigating um, an accident. Now you're interviewing some eyewitnesses and you find out you have four of them, and every one of them is remarkably accurate and was really paying attention when it all happened, and you're very glad for that, but one of those eyewitnesses was in the car following from behind when the accident happened. A second witness was coming the other way down the street when it happened. A third one was a pedestrian standing beside the road. And a fourth one was standing on an overpass and was looking down from above. Now you can imagine that if all four of them tell exactly the same story without any variances, you've got to believe there's collusion going on. They met together and colluded as to how that story was told. Um, you would expect from a different vantage point that each one of them would see something that the other didn't see, even though they'd agree on all the major issues. And that's exactly what we have in the four gospel accounts of the life, death, and now resurrection of Jesus. Uh, you know, Matthew has his own unique perspective. He's a Levite. He's writing to a primarily Jewish audience, and he wants to prove that Jesus is the long-expected Messiah. Uh, Mark is writing from Rome, and he's writing to a primarily Roman audience, and his uh, gospel is action-packed, and he always says immediately, immediately, immediately. In other words, he's trying to to make the action go by quickly because of the kind of an audience that he wants to reach. Uh, Luke is writing to a primarily Greek audience. He's wanting to show that Jesus is indeed the divine son as well as fully man. And then, of course, uh, John, who writes last of all, uh, he's assuming that that most Christians in his day had already read the other three accounts. So they were in they were already involved in the life of Jesus. But but John recognizes that there's a new generation that has now grown up and they weren't actually alive when Jesus you know, died and rose from the dead. And so he's reintroducing faith to them. So you can see there's a different perspective in all four accounts, even while all four accounts are eyewitness accounts. So I want to combine those four accounts, and I want to give you the story of Easter and tell you the glory of that story. And it may be that you've never heard it told this way. So hang on, here goes. We're going to try to tell the story, and I'm I'm going to read some of it because I want to make sure that I don't miss what I'm about to say. Let's talk with the de- let's start with the death of Jesus. You know, the last living moments of Jesus on the cross, he cries out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And, and with that, he bows his head and he dies. And at that very moment, the veil in the temple is torn in two from top to bottom, and it, it uncovers the Holy of Holies. And uh, then there's a great earthquake that's in the city, and the rocks are split. The city is reeling under what I would say is the outrage of the death of the Messiah on a cross. And one centurion, Roman soldier, witnessing the phenomenon, cries out, truly, this is the Son of God. Now, there were a group of women who were left from all the followers of Jesus, standing there until the bitter end. The disciples had long ago fled, and as the day was wearing down, There was the body of Jesus, the lifeless body of Jesus, still hanging on the cross. You know, it must have seemed barren and cold. It was overwhelmingly empty, and the show's over. 
You know, there's, everyone is going home. And for that group of courageous and faithful women, I would say hope had died in their hearts that day. They had believed that Jesus was a long expected Messiah, but now it seemed to them that the Jesus movement was officially over. All that was left was, you know, the humiliated people trying to comfort each other, find solace with one another. Now, there were a few courageous people left. I mean, one is a man named Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, Joseph was a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin, and he was a secret follower of Jesus, which is astounding to me. So he must have been there among the men that were judging Jesus. He must have been. And he would have said absolutely nothing. So I think the man's lacking in spine. Uh, this man is a coward to stand up when it really counts. But somehow he got courage at this moment, and Pilate gave him permission that he would be able to take the body of Jesus and take it down from the, the cross. So you have to imagine here, Joseph is climbing up a ladder to the cross, and he's yanking out the nails out of Jesus' mangled, lifeless corpse, and he lets it fall in a crumpled heap to the ground. He's joined by another follower named Nicodemus. And then they took clean linen and they wrapped him carefully and they quickly added some spices and they must have put the body on a cart and they brought it to a tomb that Joseph had purchased for his family as a family burial site. No one had been laid there before. You know, it's almost the Sabbath. The sun is setting on that Friday and there was no way to prepare the body properly according to Jewish custom. So they just simply added a few spices um, without embalming in a hot climate. You know, there would be a lot of stench, the odor of death. And so they roll a large stone across it and soon would come the Sabbath and they would leave it right like it was. The women that were there at the cross all followed Joseph to his tomb. And no doubt they were stunned and they were weeping. And they were making up their minds that when the Sabbath was over, they were going to come back to the, to the very tomb uh, and, uh, and uh, properly make sure that Jesus' body was cared for in a way that was dignified and respectful. But there had also been a rumor that had already begun to circulate that the disciples of Jesus would somehow steal the body. So immediately a Roman guard is placed at the tomb to guard it. These would have been hardened fighting men who would not let anyone come near that body. Well, Sabbath came and went, and now it's Sunday. It's sunrise, and the group of women who had been at the cross are gathered together. They have spices, they have burial perfumes, they want to hide the odor of death. This is going to be a proper burial, and no doubt there wouldn't have been sure how they would roll the body away. Perhaps they had in mind that they'd ask the soldiers for that help. We just simply don't know. But this was their last act of love, and we do know who some of the women were. One of them was Mary Magdalene, and there was another Mary that was there as well. She was the mother of two of the disciples. Another woman's name was Salome, and a, and a fourth one was named Joanna. There were probably others, but we don't know their names. But they gathered as a group, and they wanted to get it done. Well, on their way there, there was a second earthquake. Of course, the women wouldn't have known what the, this earthquake actually meant. But at that very moment, the women are still on their way, but at that moment, at the tomb, powerful angels, mighty warriors of God, descend down on the tomb. The Roman guard, these battle-hardened men, had never seen such a sight before. It was unstoppable terror, and they ran as men who are cowards do when they run on the day of battle. And the angels pulled away the stone, and Jesus stepped forth from the tomb. He had broken death's power. He had defeated that ancient enemy and laid it in ruins. He was not like the resurrection of Lazarus. He stepped out of the tomb as a new order of humanity. This was the day when deathless life for the very first time was introduced to this earth. An everlasting life, an eternal life, a life that right now is promised to all who believe. Of course, it doesn't mean that we're not gonna die, you know that but it does mean that we have already received the promise of the same life of Christ. Christ stepped out of the tomb, but uh, it needs to be said, especially for those who doubt, it needs to be said that there was no one there to see the resurrection outside of the angels. There were no disciples. The women were not there yet. Joseph of Arimathea was nowhere near that tomb. Uh, none of the Roman soldiers saw it. Angels saw it, and God the Father saw it. So I know what you know, critics will right away say. 
They'll say, well, if that's the case, how do we know it really happened? Well, hang on, because the story is not yet over. Mary Magdalene and the women with her did come to the tomb and they found that the stone had been rolled away. And they did see two men standing there, but they didn't know that they were angels. The other women also wondered what all this meant and, and immediately a discussion arose. Mary seems to have left the group at this point in time and she had gone back into the city. She went to look for Peter and John to say, look, someone has disturbed the tomb. They don't, I don't know where they've left him. She doesn't have an explanation as to what's happened, only this. She says to them, they have taken him. And by that she meant the soldiers did, or maybe the authorities did, or maybe the Jewish leaders did. She didn't know who they meant, but they had removed the body. It's empty, the tomb is now, and the stone is rolled away, and there's nobody around, it's barren. Well, while she's out looking for Peter and John to tell them that, the rest of the women remained at the tomb. One of the angels uh, led the other women into the tomb and showed them the grave clothes of Jesus and they were all neatly folded. And then the angel said to the women, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, he's risen. Go tell the disciples that he's risen. He's going to go before you into Galilee. That's where he started his ministry and in the end you'll spend much time with him there. Well, of course, meanwhile, Mary Magdalene is unaware of this other event. And she's found Peter and John, and she's told them about the body of Jesus. And by this time, the other women have left the tomb, and they've gone to look for the other disciples, but Peter and John want to go and see it for themselves. But, you know, the urgency of it, and, you know, the outrage that someone would remove the body, the emotions were just taking over both of them, and they decided to run, and they started running as fast as they could to the area of the tomb. Well, John was always faster, and he came to the tomb first and he peered in and, yup, she's right, there's no body, there's no one around, it's just simply empty. And Peter, he's huffing and puffing, comes up from behind and he's always more impulsive and he bursts right into the tomb and he sees the grave clothes neatly folded. And John, who wrote about this, simply confessed that neither he nor Peter um, understood the scriptures, he said, or the prophecies that the Christ would rise from the dead. But John says he instantly believed but Peter didn't, it was confusing. And the both of them leave, they don't have any answers and they wander all the way back to Jerusalem. Well, Mary's left standing at the tomb and as she stands there all alone, she simply starts to weep. She can't control this cascade of emotions that she feels, this hopelessness and this despair and she just feels herself um, losing all sense of propriety. And then still weeping, she looks deeply into the tomb for the first time. She walks right in and she finds herself staring at two angels, and she's speechless. How did they get there? Why are you weeping, they ask. And she explains, you know, they've taken his body away. I don't know where he is. And then suddenly there's another man right there behind her. She notices him, but she doesn't turn around. She just assumes that it must be the gardener because there was always a gardener in that garden. But the gardener simply quietly says behind her, why are you weeping? And without so much as looking up, through her tears, she simply says, they have taken him away. It's now so barren. Well, then the man behind her simply says, Mary. And how often she'd heard that voice before. That voice that had driven out seven demons from her. That voice that had called her to follow him when no one else even wanted her and everyone rejected her. That voice that had taught her about the kingdom of God, that voice that had healed the blind and the lame, that voice had, that had assured her that God was love, that voice had caused her to believe, oh yes, when he said Mary, she recognized him immediately and she whirled around and there standing there is not the gardener but her savior, Jesus himself. And in a voice of devotion, she hangs on to him and she says, Rabboni, it means teacher. You know, I find it so fascinating that when Jesus revealed himself, he revealed himself not just to a woman, but he revealed himself to a woman whom everyone else thought was of low reputation and low character. But that's how Jesus is. He always picks those individuals, don't you know, who are rejected by everyone else. He's come to seek lost people sinful people, people who know they have no savior. That's who he comes to seek. That's why he showed himself to Mary first. 
And of course, Mary wants to cling to him, but he won't let her. I think the reason he won't let her is, is actually quite a simple reason. He's not yet ready to ascend into heaven. And so he says, you don't have to hang on to me. You're going to see me again in the next while. Well, news of Mary's encounter spreads quickly, as well as what Peter and John saw. But most men, they simply, they don't believe. I mean, the rest of the disciples were not gullible men. Ah, these were not pampered individuals. These were hard realists who know pain and loss. They had seen death on plenty of other occasions, and they had also been there and watched Jesus brutalized right in front of him, and they had lost their courage. And basically, I would assume they'd probably lost a great deal of their faith. Well, that was the end of the account. There was Mary's story, and that was the rest of the stories that went on, but that was it. Well, they started going their own way, and two of them went back to Emmaus. It's seven miles from Jerusalem, and they had had enough. And as they walked, they were discussing everything that had happened along the way. And somehow, and we don't know how, but somehow another man came along beside them and started to talk to them. And this man was explaining from the scripture, didn't you know that the Messiah had to die on a cross and that he had, be, had to be raised from the dead? And he was interesting and he was profound. And, and they, they entered into a conversation with him and they said, look, come on over to our house. And he joins them for a meal. And as he breaks bread, God suddenly opens these two guys' eyes and they realize who it is. I mean, how could they have not known that they were looking into the face of Jesus? They simply stare at him. Here is their Lord here at their table. How is it even possible? And suddenly he simply vanishes. Well, during that day, Jesus appears to the other women who had come to the tomb. Also in that same day, we're told that Jesus appeared to Peter and it was just the two of them for a while. And we're told nothing about that encounter. I have no doubt that Peter and Jesus had a lot to talk about and whatever was said between them, we've never heard. But I have no doubt that Jesus breathed love into Peter and let him know that he was accepted and loved. And by evening of that same, uh, the same Sunday, 10 of the 11 disciples gathered in a locked room. They were still afraid of the Jewish religious leaders. And they exchanged among, e among each other all the amazing events of that day. It was the story of, the, of Mary and of the other women. And then of Peter's encounter and the two of them on the road to Emmaus. I mean, the stories were there and they were utterly fantastic. Uh, but the rest of them just couldn't comprehend it all. It was confusing to them. They just needed more time to think about it. They needed to get some rest, maybe get some sleep, and form new conclusions in the morning. Well, then suddenly in the middle of the room, Jesus is there. How did he get in? The door is locked. Perhaps it's some kind of a vision. Maybe it's just a ghostly encounter, but he sure looks real. And then he speaks. Do you think I'm a spirit? Do you think I'm an apparition? Do you not believe? Come and see my hands and my feet, where the nails were driven in. Come see where the spear sliced through my side. You touch me. I'm made of flesh and bones. I'm real. And as they did, it was incredible. Is this really happening? Then they said, and then he said to them, I should say, he said, do you have something to eat? And they all sat down and they ate with him. Well, it's eight days later, one week later. And he appears a second time in that same room. And this time, Thomas, who wasn't there at the other time, is among them. And you remember, we call him Doubting Thomas, and he's very vocal. You guys are lunatics. I don't know what it is that you saw, but you must have convinced one another. And I'll tell you, unless I myself put my hands into that crevice where the nail had been, and unless I put my hands into his side, I'm just not going along with you guys. I don't know what you've eaten or drunk or what you've smoked for that matter. I don't believe this has happened. And then as he loudly announces, suddenly Jesus appears among them again. Go ahead, Thomas, go ahead. Do what you said you must do. And his nervous and trembling hands reach out to the crater that the nails had carved out in his hands. He now realizes it's undeniable. Thomas feels his knees giving way and he falls to his knees and he whispers, my Lord and my God. And for the next 40 days, Jesus spent a lot of time with them. You know, once they went fishing, and Jesus made breakfast for them. And at the same time, Jesus went for a long walk with Peter. 
and repeatedly asked him, Peter, do you love me? And it, it broke Peter's heart, but Jesus wanted Peter to understand that he was reinstating him as the leader among the band. Peter was going to receive dignity and be assured that Christ loved him in spite of the fact that when the chips were down, he denied he had ever known him. Jesus was very convinced that he would reinstate him. Once Jesus met with his own half-brother by the name of James. You know, James had never believed in Jesus all the way throughout Jesus' ministry. He stood afar. And James, like Thomas, came to believe. And he became a leader and a senior pastor of the First Christian Church in Jerusalem. And once he actually preached to a crowd of 500 at the same time, and those never forgot as long as they lived. And finally, he gathered all of them on a mountain. It was probably on the Mount of Olives. And he gave them a great commission. He said to them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And behold, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. And then as they were looking on, he was lifted up into heaven and they saw him no more. And that's how you get the Christian church. You know, people have been preaching this account of Jesus for quite some time. And it bears a notice that there are some things that are undeniable. These 11 men who had all seen Jesus raised from the dead, who had put hands on him and touched the places where the nails had gone in and recognized that he was genuine flesh and bone. These men who had seen him die a horrible death now saw him alive again. And if you think that they were simply making it up, know this. These men all died for a faith that they had come to inherit. Telling the story that they had seen the resurrection of Jesus involved a backlash from the various cultures where they went to spread the news. And every single one of them, with the exception of one, died a martyr's death. Not one of them broke ranks. Not one of them said, no, we all made that stuff up. They took this stuff all the way to their graves. Men don't normally do that, but these men had seen something. They had seen death's power broken, and they had seen their Lord and Master alive again. See, there's also the other phenomenon, and that is it's not just among the 11. We've already mentioned Mary Magdalene. We've already mentioned the other women who had all seen Jesus alive. We've already mentioned James. We've already mentioned that there were 500 at one time. The story simply went on and on. You could at that point in time interview any one of them. That's why the story was never exposed as a hoax. It was always absolutely true. And then finally, Jesus had left us with a promise. He will return. And it's that promise that every single believer lives with. If it seems fantastic to you that one day Jesus who walked on this earth will return again and will reign as king and lord over the entire earth, then know this. That's not as fantastic as the story of an individual who was so tortured that he finally died and his crumpled, broken body is laid into a tomb and laid there to rot. And then out of that very tomb, he rises from the dead and shows himself alive with convincing proofs. See, that's the story of Easter. That's this undying story. It just won't go away. That's how we know that death has lost its grip, that death has been defeated, and that Christ makes an offer to everyone who will listen. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Come to me if you're bowed down with your sin. I will forgive you by my work on the cross. If you're doubting whether or not I'm Lord of heaven and earth, then know this, I have done that which no one else had done. I not only conquered armies, I conquered death itself. And that's the story of Easter. We know that the one we worship, Jesus Christ, is not like any other prophet. This one alone is Lord of heaven and earth. He is Lord of life and death, absolutely certain. So this Easter, I want to say this to, you know, to all of you who are spending time at Easter, either in front of a television or a computer screen or, or something of that nature, and you're all alone in your house. It doesn't matter if we're quarantined or not. Let me tell you this. Death has lost its grip. We know that we are the children of the resurrection. There is reason for hope. There is reason for undying optimism. It's Easter, and we should say, He is risen he is risen indeed.
I'm going to end with a little story. You know, the story is told of the time when the communist movement had begun in Russia, which became, of course, the Soviet Union. And in the early days of the communist revolution, the communists were determined all the way, actually, through their reign to destroy every vestige of the Christian faith. And, and on this one occasion, uh, the communists had come into a large Orthodox church, and they demanded to have the bulk of the service where they would explain all the reasons why they knew that God does not exist. And the Orthodox priest was allowed a five-minute rebuttal if he wanted to take it. Well, the communist uh, leader gave this powerful rendition of how we know now that there is no God. And when he was done, the Orthodox priest was allowed to come to the stage. He came forward and he didn't need five minutes. Indeed, he didn't need one minute or even 30 seconds. He simply said one line. He said to the vast congregation assembled that day, he is risen. And with that, the congregation exploded in response, he is risen indeed. Yes, indeed. This is the final testimony. This is the reason why we believe. This is the reason why we are assured that there is life after death and that all of the promises of God are true. My brothers and sisters, Happy Easter. 